My name is Ross Jordan. I'm the curatorial manager here at the museum. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this event um, and to joining us on this Sunday for this spooky day. Um, not only do we have events today, other family days coming up as well in the future. Um, you can join us on October 22nd at 6 p.m. Chicago time um, for a discussion of feminism and institutional building um, and a new release of a book called Where the Future Comes From. That's at six o'clock Chicago time, central time, um, at uh, um, uh, right here on our Facebook live page and um, on, it'll be on YouTube afterward as well. Um, for today's event, we are actually recording it. So if you have to step out or miss something, um, know that you can come back to our Facebook page in the future and our website in the future um, to uh, watch the event then. Um, other future events like this coming up on November 1st, we're hosting an event um, that's tackling uh, uh, voting, uh, democratic participation and art making in the arts here at Whole House. And of course, the arts at Whole House were an important part of um, how de democracy and, and um, uh, people had got access to democracy and could share and, and share their uh, personal expression. Um, so come back for that as well, November 1st at noon, Chicago time. Um, and then a uh, quick housekeeping for today. Um, people can use it, both the chat and the Q&A function to ask questions throughout today's program. If you're joining us from Facebook Live, we'll also um, uh, answer your questions there as well. So we won't be able to get to all the questions about hauntings at Hull House, but we'll try to get to them as we go. And we'll post answers to those questions uh, throughout next week as this event um, goes on. So use the Q&A and chat functions to, to talk with us as well. Um, and again, this program is being recorded. So uh, look out for things you missed in the future as well. Um, with that, I wanna welcome you all back to Whole House for this special family day, the haunting of Whole House. And I'm gonna uh, send it over to our um, education team, Stefan and Adi, to get us kicked off. Hi everyone, my name is Stefan. I'll be one of the co-hosts um, and one of the uh, educators who created this family day, the haunting of Hull House. Um, Nadia, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, um, my name is Nadia Moraga. I'm the other uh, de developer for this event. Um, and we're excited to get started today, so. Yeah, we're just really passionate about all things spooky and it's Halloween time. So it sounded like the perfect time to create this event. And I know people are super interested in the supernatural um, and we get questions all the time in the museum when it was open uh, pre-COVID uh, when like about the ghosts, like who's here, who's haunting the area and you'll all get to find that out today. So before we dive into all of the spooky stuff, we're gonna do a little bit of an introduction on Hull House itself um, because a lot of people don't necessarily have the background of it. Um, and so we're gonna start there. So Hull House, the Hull House Settlement House uh, opened in 1889 um, in Chicago and it was founded by Jane Addams and Ellen Gates Starr. Um, they were two uh, upper class, well, very well educated white women. Um, they were very uh, passionate about trying to find ways to help people. Um, and so they felt that opening a settlement house in a neighborhood uh, that was already dealing with a lot of uh, poverty, dealing with a lot of difficulty in terms of public health struggles um, and very much uh, populated by uh, immigrant factory workers um, would be a good place to create a facility like this. So what a settlement house was, um, was a, uh, in, an institution that originally was designed to give people opportunities to get involved in the arts, um, get involved in literature, philosophy, those sorts of things. But very soon after um, Ellen Gates Starr and Jane Addams set up shop, they realized that the needs in the neighborhood were of a much more practical nature. And so they found themselves creating programs for public health, um, for uh, they did have many arts and crafts um, programs and classes that people in the neighborhood were able to attend. Um, they had English classes, citizenship classes. Um, they created it uh, to be a space for people to gather and to um, organize. And so they had lots of union organizers there as well. And over time, that became uh, more and more well known throughout Chicago and kind of became a template across the country in a lot of ways for settlement houses that began to spring up. Um, Hull House, however, 
did stop its operation in the site of our museum um, in 1963. That's because that land and that area was acquired by what became the University of uh, Illinois at Chicago campus. Um, and so they then expanded their operations across the Chicago, uh, Chicago, Chicago land area and like different individual spaces and offices. And that was operational until 2012 as the Hull House Association. Uh, sadly, due to budget problems um, and issues of organization, that association did have to cease operation in 2012. Um, and then after that, uh, the only thing that's, you know, connected to Hull House of that era is our museum. So we're hoping to keep that legacy alive. Um, and so here we are today. Anything you'd like to add, Stefan? No, you really said everything. I <laughs> okay. the entire history, it's just to put it lightly and to keep it short and sweet. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much everything. Uh, but now that you have that, it's a good like, like frame uh, to set up what the Hull House actually was and why a place that created so many social services and programs is also filled with so many ghost stories, right? So many legends and urban legends and like what the purpose of that uh, served and what it actually did for it, right? Because I know Jane Addams wasn't a fan of uh, the ghost stories, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, let me see if I can try to play some spooky music because I don't, I don't see that it's turned on. You want to hear that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Um, so we're here to talk about the Devil Baby and the Woman in White, two of the most famous ghost stories that come out of the Hall House. The Devil Baby, the Woman in White. So that's something cool to think about. Uh, we should be talking a little bit about the Devil Baby at first, and not even take over the Woman in White. But has anyone ever heard of the Devil Baby before? Oh, I'm sorry. Is that a little better? Yeah, that's good. Great, awesome. No, tell us about the Devil Baby. I will, I will, I will, I will. Uh, um, so the Devil Baby uh, was created during the time that Jane Addams herself was there. So around it could have, yes, yeah, so around 19, 1900 to 1910s, around that time. Um, and because of the large ethnic population that was there, the large diverse ethnic population here, uh, there were about more than 26 different ethnic groups living in the Hull House neighborhood at the time. So there were over 26 versions of the Devil Baby story. The most famous one, and the one I'm gonna tell you about today, is the Italian Catholic version. So by saying that in itself, there's an Italian Catholic version, it gets very specific that there's probably an Italian non-Catholic version. So there are many, many versions of this story that the immigrants in the community uh, had created themselves to tailor to their own ethnic group. So the Italian Catholic version essentially goes like this. Um, so there's a husband and a wife, the wife is Catholic and it said that she married an atheist. And then when she tried to put up uh, a picture of a religious figure, a saint or a picture of Jesus, the, the husband took it down and said, I'd rather have a devil in this house than a picture of Jesus in this home. And so because of this, the mother uh, gave birth to a baby with horns, a tail, and hooves. The father, out of fear and for his life, and you know, I suppose God, I think that's the message that it's trying to portray, brought it here to Hall House. And it said that Jane Adams raised the baby on the third floor in the attic um, until it passed away uh, from its, how it looks, its appearances and its deformities. Um, but there are many different versions of this story uh, there are a few that are talking about not religion, but rather the amount of children, right? In the Jewish version of it, uh, the father actually says, if I have another, uh, if another girl is born into this house, I'd rather have a devil for a baby. And then instead of a girl, uh, a devil was born and it was brought to Hall House. So it all sort of ends the same and it all sort of starts the same uh, where a father uh, tries to control uh, how the household is run. Uh, how his wife sort of navigates through the home and what she believes in um, and gender, the gender of the baby, that's not really her control, 
right? And so that in itself sort of gives Jane Addams uh, a feel of like why this story was created, right? Um, so Jane Addams wasn't a fan of this story herself. She really thought it took away from the work that they were actually trying to do at Hull House because after this story was published in The Atlantic um, and sort of made its way around the neighborhood, uh, there was a line of people for more than six weeks lining around the block uh, around Hull House and people were like, I'll pay you 50 cents, I'll pay you a dollar, I'll pay you $2 if you show me the devil baby, which in that time was quite a bit of money, right? That's 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 pretty. That's a pretty hefty sum to pay to see a devil baby. Um, and so Jane Addams was saying that this story is not true, uh, that the reason this story was created was to sort of uh, protect women actually, right? To make sure that husbands and fathers were treating their wives and their children uh, with love and care instead of with disappointment and with um, and saying like, oh, you better not do this. You better not give birth to a baby girl, which she really has no control over that. <laughs> um, and so it was a way for women to sort of uh, protect themselves by, you know, by putting fear into the hearts of men. Right, and so that's how it was sort of set up. But it's still said that you can hear the baby crying within the mansion at night if you if you listen close enough uh, after after the hour after uh, the museum hours are closed. Um, does anyone have any questions so far about the devil baby? Okay. Okay, cool. It doesn't seem like we have any questions, but yeah, it's a really fascinating. Uh, yeah, it actually uh, Rosemary's Baby was inspired by the Devil Baby, which is cool. Um, yes, yes, it was. <laughs> uh, it never. I don't think it grew. I, uh, from what I hear from all the legends, it it died. Like it, it passed away, um, and like the like they they all have different versions of how the baby interacts with the family uh it said that upon its birth it spoke uh perfect perfectly like it, it could already speak it could already pronunciate enunciate um and it there's another one that says it took the, upon its birth it snatched the cigarette from its uh, from his father's mouth and smoked it himself so there are different uh why did the mother didn't want the photo of God? It was actually the father that didn't want the photo uh, of God because he was an atheist. And so he wanted to keep it, I guess, secular. Um, but I, I think that was sort of the moral of the story is like, don't, I guess for like people like don't marry an atheist or I suppose since like a lot of um, immigrant communities, you know, uh, Irish, Mexican, Italian are very Catholic, are very religious, and it's kind of strange to, well, back in the day, to marry outside of your religion, right? Not, not now so much. It's not the, not that's not the case. Uh, it's a bit more open now, but back in the day, you were supposed to marry uh, someone within your own religion, someone within your own ethnic group. Um, yes, yeah, so lots of cultural fear uh, in marrying someone who was outside of your faith, outside of your ethnic group. Um, and even with a few of the other ones saying like, I don't want another girl in my family or I don't want you to give birth to another baby girl. Uh, it was a lot of shame and sexism and misogyny that was surrounded at that because why would he want, like why a girl specifically, right? So that was it. Uh, yeah, if no one has any other questions, Nadia, do you want to talk about the woman in white, the other ghost that haunts the Hall House? Yeah, so um, before I jump into our woman in white, um, I'm just wondering, has anybody heard of the lady in white or the woman in white? It's a very common uh, ghost trope that you'll see in pretty much any culture across the world. So um, has anybody heard of that before? And if so, what are some examples that you can think of? Yeah, Ghost Bride, La Llorona, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, most, um, it's really interesting uh, that most major historically haunted sites um, have some form of a woman in white. Um, it's that common. Yep, I'm pretty sure it does. 
the haunted mansion absolutely um and the the kind of the through line for all of these historical figures is that they had very tragic either lives or their death was very tragic um a lot of the time it overlaps with the phantom hitchhiker story where someone will pick up a hitchhiker and then they disappear before they reach their destination um and um a lot of the time as well they were very unfulfilled in life or you know, had uh, struggled and encountered a lot of hardship in their lives. Um, yeah, the, the Vanishing Hitchhiker one is pretty creepy. We actually have a combo of Vanishing Hitchhiker and uh, Lady in White here in Chicago, who's pretty well known, Resurrection Mary, um, who's said to haunt uh, Archer Avenue. So um, that's a big one. But yeah, uh, absolutely. And like you mentioned, Yala Yorona, if you guys have watched movies like The Grudge or The Ring, um, those uh, figures are of an Eastern Asian variation of the woman in white as well. So, so yeah, we hear about these these figures all the time. Um, so it's pretty cool that at Hull House we have our own. So Hull House was actually built. Um, Stefan, remind me what year? Eighteen. So it was built in 1856, but the Hull House you, was you. established in 1889. Correct. So the building itself was a vacation home um, that belonged to a man named Charles J. Hull. He was a very well, uh, well-respected and well-known real estate developer and entrepreneur. Um, and it was kind of on the outskirts of Chicago at that time. It was well before it became such a booming factory area. Um, and so his wife was named Millicent Ann Co. Hull. And she actually passed away in the house in 1860 of an illness, and uh, she died in her bedroom. And, and so after she passed away, it was said that her spirit remained in the house and haunted it. Um, and that uh, was really perpetuated by people who were renting the space before Jane Addams and Ellen Gates start, uh, entered Hull House. They actually, for the first year or so, had to share the space with people who were renting it as well. Um, and so there were lots of stories that she would be on the second level and in the attic. Um, and they said that she would wander out of her bedroom and she would make noise in the day and I mean, in the nighttime. Um, and it was pretty well known around the neighborhood. So Jane Adams, when she when they began renting the space, she was already aware of Millicent's ghost. Um, there are claims that Jane Adams talked about uh, her bedroom having been Millicent's bedroom and so seeing her and encountering her at different times. Can say Jane Adams never recorded that herself in any of her writings. Uh, but she did write a little bit about um, some of the measures that were taken by the people who were uh, renting the, the space as beforehand. Um, she wrote that in regards to the attic being believed to be haunted, that uh, it had a half skeptical reputation for a haunted attic, so far respected by the tenants living on the second floor, that they always kept a large pitcher full of water on the attic stairs. Their explanation of this custom was so incoherent that I was sure it was a survival of the belief that a ghost could not cross running water, but perhaps that interpretation was only my eagerness for finding folklore. So Jane Addams liked the idea of the story in terms of it being a cultural holdover, um, or as she said, a folkloric element. Um, but as Stefan mentioned earlier, she wasn't a fan of all the ghost stories. Um, so that is Our Lady in White. Uh, there are some stories of other apparitions that have said to have been seen around Hull House, including ghost children running around on the second floor, um, as well as uh, I've read about ghost children in our courtyard and a, a monk in our courtyard. Um, so we don't really have documentation on those stories. That's more stories that have been passed orally. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty spooky place in regards to those spirits. There's also um, someone who uh, is said to like be on the steps as well. The intro steps? Yeah, the, 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 no, not the intro steps, the steps leading to the second floor. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So people say that when they take a picture there, they see a shadow behind them or like an orb of light behind them. Um, well, maybe that's Millicent. Maybe it's Millicent. Yeah, sometimes they say it's a man though, so. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, I have not been able to find details on what Millicent, uh, what illness Millicent had. Um, and so I can't speak to that, um, but she did die, um, I believe in her forties um, of an illness. Yeah, those attic stairs, it, it's, uh, it's not fun, it's pretty rickety, <laughs> so. 
if you yeah. want if you want to read more about what Jane Addams had to say about the ghosts in general she wrote a book called the long road of women's memory um and she writes for three chapters about the devil baby and how much she hates that much mm -hmm. <laughs> if anyone's interested in that that's a resource you can definitely uh look for flip through and read if you want to learn more about it and like what Jane Addams had to say about it for herself does anybody have any other questions about either of those figures or anything? So you guys, we're getting some good questions in our Q&A. Um, and in case people aren't able to see them, I think one of them that a lot of people are uh, wondering about is if the devil baby, if that was a birth defect or what exactly that might have been. I know we have some um, uh, talk about that, you know, amongst us and amongst the or, um, but if y'all can just uh, kind of flesh that out a little bit for people on what we do know. Yeah, so um, I answered it a little bit while Nadia was speaking, but many think that uh, that the baby did have a birth defect um, because on some of the legends, they said that the baby was born with scales and there is a, a very rare birth defect that can appear that way uh, called Harley Quinn's disease. And so some people think that um, that the baby did was born with birth defects and it was exaggerated to make it seem like it was a double baby uh since at that time it was associated that like illness was somehow seen as a punishment from god right uh physical illness mental illness was sometimes seen as a punishment from god and so oftentimes there are people who think that the actual the baby was a normal baby just with some birth defects and they made it into a story or someone saw the baby and made it into a story uh, of the double baby and so that could have also been something um, about the baby if it had existed at all. Um, and that's just something I know about it a little bit. But yes, as Eddie said, we cannot confirm that the baby has existed. Uh, so it's hard to tell. There are no records of, um, of that. Yes, thank you, Audrey, for the link to The Long Road of Woman's Sister. Yeah, it's the first three chapters where she talks about it. So she's pretty upset about it. Um, and she elaborates um, in very specific, interesting ways about um, experiences of different people in the neighborhood and how it directly, the story directly affected their families um, and kind of how different groups of people responded to it in different ways. So um, it is a fascinating read. Um, I see that we were asked what has actually been seen in Hull House and how often. We're gonna um, talk about I'm sorry. We're going to talk about that. Early. Yeah, so that's what we're going to be jumping to next. Mm -hmm. Well, so I could take that over. So I've been working at the Hall House for about four or five years. I've been there for quite a bit of time. Um, and I have definitely seen my fair share of experiences uh, when it comes to things that I can't quite explain. Um, so one of the first things that people, that is pretty consistently happens in the actual museum is that you can hear footsteps on the second floor, uh, even if nobody's there. So you can hear like paces, uh, people walking back and forth, back and forth, even though you know no one else is in the museum. Um, another thing that we had happen is that once in our library, we had a bookshelf that had belonged to the, to the library itself and some of the old books that Jane Addams might've had in her library. Um, and I was giving a tour to a group of students and uh, I was showing them, I wasn't talking about the ghost at any means. Like I usually don't talk about it until the end cause they get really excited um, and then don't wanna focus on anything else. So they just wanna ask me a bunch of ghost questions. So I usually save it till the end. I was really talking about the books on the shelf when one of them flew off. It didn't fall, it flew a good five, 10 feet and everyone just started screaming. Everyone was screaming and it took me 15 minutes to calm them all down. Um, and then I gave a little bit of the background as to like the, the importance of the shelf. So the shelf itself, um, we get a lot of books that would fall off the shelf. Um, and they were, they weren't books that like were on, like on the ledge, they were books that were sandwiched in between other books and they would be fall, they would be on the ground when we would come in uh, or we would hear something and then see the book on the ground, even though no one had been in there. Um, so that is another piece that is sort of like haunted or spooky or supernatural. Another thing that was really intense for me is that I've been locked in the kitchen three times and uh, nobody has done it. The door just slams shut and it locks and then it unlocks by itself after a few minutes. So it's happened to me three times 
and no one has been around to witness it because no one has been able to let me out. The door just unlocks by itself. Um, and that's not in the museum itself. It's actually in the building next door, the residence dining hall. Um, so I really believe that there's also something uh, that happened or is happening or haunting or you know living in that space as well not only the museum since the whole house did encompass 13 buildings i'm sure another one of them would have been haunted as well so um, i know we have a few other um, educators and staff who have had experiences so if anyone else wants to share what happened 13 oh no yes uh, originally there were 13 buildings um i sadly did not actually work on site long enough at whole house to and I say sadly for myself, it's probably fortunate for other people, but I haven't had the opportunity to have any experiences yet. So, but once we're back working on site, we'll see. So we're currently not open to the public due to the pandemic, so. Ross, Michael, do any of you wanna share your experiences, your spooky experiences at Hull House? Sure, I would love to. Um, so, hi, I'm Michael Romero, the education manager at the museum. And uh, I've been working at the museum for a little over nine years now and have had quite a few experiences. Um, I think uh, for people, I know there's one person in our, our meeting today that was actually um, a previous staff member and uh, can remember that on the first day that I started, they asked, what are you most excited about working here? The answer was ghosts. Um, so I think I've always invited them in. Um, but I've had, um, I've heard people talking downstairs in our residence dining hall, um, sounding like a woman speaking, and there was another staff member um, in that space. And when I walked in to ask what she had said, she thought I had said something. So we both had heard this woman speaking, but uh, it was kind of a disembodied voice. Um, but I've also had, uh, similar to Stefan, doors slamming shyly, um, people sounding like they are in our uh, butler pantry, uh, kind of our, where our coffee and stuff is at, uh, sounding like, you know, rifling through things when we go in there, uh, nobody's in that space. Um, I've had a chair for on a tour with a group of people in the room um, and similar to Stefan as well, talking about the ghosts and what they meant to uh, the settlement house. And as soon as we started talking about them, the chair slid out from under the desk and fell over. Um, and everyone kind of just looked at the chair. Nobody really said anything, but it was a, a creepy experience. And um, I was told by a previous guest that uh, for the spiritual realm and our connection to it, that blood type may uh, play some kind of factor into that. Um, and so uh, with, I have a universal blood type and they said that that may be a reason why more things happen to me than um, some of the other staff members who may have not experienced it. Um, but I think a, a, to our museum and something we are really known for and not just this season, but all year we have people come ask this question so um you know it's great that you all were able to to talk about that a little bit more that's just some of my experience ross do you want to go next thank you michael hey yeah um what I'll share is kind of, I guess, two things. And th this has happened to me a couple of times at the museum. Again, my name is Ross Jordan. I'm a curatorial manager at the museum. Um, and one of the, I guess, key things that's happened to me a couple of times is being on different floors. And of course, uh, our offices are in the um, a, a building that Jane Adams actually built called the Residence Dining Hall. And the dining hall is a space where the reformers at the end of their day doing all their social reform work would come together and um, discuss what the day's work had been, catch up on news and information from across the world and the other people that they were in touch with who were doing social reform works, work in um, other parts in, in New York City, um, in the Midwest um, and in London. And so it was a gathering space at the end of the day. And to this day, the museum continues to use that space as our public programming site. 
Um, and so we're always moving between our offices on the, on the top floor where the music school used to be and the uh, bottom floor of the residence dining hall where we host all our public events. Um, uh, but there's been times where I've been in the museum and I'll be in the offices on the second floor and I'll hear my name from someone on the first floor and I'll you know come bumbling down the stairs to see what's going on and either there's no one there or um, there's people there, like two or three people, one of our staff members there. And, um, and uh, they, I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, nothing, we're doing whatever we're doing. Um, and I'm like, well, I just heard my name upstairs and I came down to see what's up. And no one said my name and no one needed me. So that's happened a couple of times at least. Um, and then of course the museum works with lots of different um, artists because we are a museum that shows contemporary artists. And there's one artist in particular, Aram Hansen Fuentes, who opened an exhibition in 2016 about voting. And she was someone who's very interested in, in, in ghosts in following ghosts and got excited um, when we told her that, you know, our, our museum and our dining hall, you know, have like haunting stories. Um, and she went around with one of those like phones that tracks when ghosts show up. And, caught a few and took a bunch of, you know, odd, strange photos that had, um, had sh weird shadows in them or kind of unexplained lights. And this was, you know, about four years ago when she was working in the museum, working on our, our, our uh, voting exhibition called Unofficial Official Voting Stations for those who cannot vote. Um, and so I think our, there's lots of ghost hunters, both professional and amateur, um, that swing by the museum to, um, to find these stories. I think there's this interest in um, connecting to the, to the history, but also connecting to the, the I guess the, um, the spirits um, that are there. And people of course talk about the whole house spirit and what that was, but it also is kind of the, the uh, spirit of these ghosts that still um, haunt us and walk about. Um, anyway, those are, my, those are my stories. It's Ross. Um, I see we have a question in which room did Mrs. Hull die? Yes, Jane Adams' bedroom. Um, thank you, Stefan. Um, it, Hull House is a pretty co consistent stop on lots of the ghost tours that happen in Chicago. Uh, there's several of those, they're pretty popular. Um, something that I personally always find entertaining is that a lot of the ghost photos of Hull House that you'll see online are actually smudges on windows. Um, from people putting their faces and their like ear up to the window to try to like get a better look inside. Um, and so if you do see those photos, it might be an earmark and not a ghost. Um, I remember at one instance, they were on every window. Someone had taken the time <laughs> put their, I think it was like a greasy ear because I don't know how else um, they put their ear against the window and it was every single window on the first floor. We could not find a window that had not had like finger and ear smudges all over mm -hmm. every single window. Um, and we were laughing about it for quite some time. Another cool thing about Jane Adams's bedroom is that people walk in and they feel something. They don't oh, know yeah. it's haunted yet because I haven't told them or another educator hasn't told them, but they feel, and they're like, something happened here. And they're like, I feel, I feel weird in here. There's something strange that happened in here. So there's an energy that definitely uh, continues to live in Jane Adams's bedroom. And that's, that's where it concentrates mostly. That's where people walk in and they feel like they shiver and they're like, ooh. <laughs> no, I greet that room. Every time we open for the morning, I'll go in and I'll just be like, hi, good morning. You know, <laughs> I'm here. But um, yeah, definitely there's an energy in there and I like intentionally spent time in that space just trying to acclimate to it, so. Um, I see we have a question. What's your favorite or most memorable visit from ghost hunters? I was not there for any ghost hunter visits, but what about you guys? I like how excited they are. I really love their energy and their passion. And even before they get there, they're like, I don't know about this place. So tell me about it because I heard this on like the History Channel or uh, or some YouTuber, right? Who's doing like a top 10 haunted places in Chicago. And they're like, I don't know what this place is. Tell me about it. And they kind of piece together of like why it's haunted, like why it's significant, why there would be a ghost story here. Uh, but I really like their passion uh, when they come in and how excited they are um, about learning more. And Eddie said, whenever we have school groups, we conspire with the teacher to turn off the lights in Jane Adams' bedroom. 
Oh, I, I love that. I love doing that. I've been doing that for four years and it never gets old. They always scream. <laughs> Um, I see. Is it a good energy for Hall House? Um, I personally have never felt any negativity. Um, it just feels like there's someone, maybe not somebody, but a, there's something there existing in the space. Um, and I just try to personally feel like, try to be respectful um, because whatever it is, has probably been there a lot longer than we have. So I'm not going to mess with anything, but it's never, I've never felt any negative energy so we have a interesting observation from someone in our uh facebook chat saying that uh with people so superstitious didn't they think that 13 buildings was unlucky i th just wanted <laughs> to bring that up because i think that's a funny observation that none of us have never noticed before i know I, when i read um i believe someone named sarah or sue who said it in the chat when they were like 13, oh no. And I'm like, oh, you're right, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> um, I don't think Jane Adams herself was superstitious though. And so she was like, whatever. She seemed very skeptical. She seemed skeptical? Yeah. yeah. Mm. I guess for the devil baby, she was just like not. Not here for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everything else, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, do do check out guys on our uh, website. You can go to um, our tours and our events and you can actually access our virtual tour and see the inside of the entire Hull House mansion. So you can explore all the rooms. You can see Jane Adams' bedroom um, as well as the rest of the house. It's There's a link in the chat for it. Thank you, Audrey. Um, so that's very cool. I recommend checking that out when you get the opportunity. Well, great. So we do have a couple of submissions of ghost stories from some of our fantastic uh, attendees today. Um, so Stefan, would you like to share one and I can share the other? Yes, uh, would you mind going first? I'm, I'm submitting or I'm posting the, the original article for the Devil Baby. Yeah, absolutely. If you wanna take the first one, please go ahead. I sure can, I'm pulling that up right now. And this, is from Mary, uh, Mary Marvin McDowell. And so this story is um, about a haunted clock, a ghost clock. Um, I, she writes that my parents got my grandparents this lovely mantle clock for their anniversary, and they also got the same clock for themselves. Once sat on our mantle for years, and it never ever charm, chimed. Grandma sat on her mantle and chimed on the quarter hour. I was really close with my grandma, and when she died, I took the clock. I put it next to my piano so she could be with me while I played. A few weeks after she passed, the clock suddenly started chiming. But it wasn't the usual chime of just bings and bongs. It was chiming to Schubert's Ave Maria. I sang Ave Maria at my grandma's funeral. The clock had been set to silent, so I had no idea it would chime at all. It actually kind of scared me, so I took the batteries out of the clock. The next day I was in the living room and the other clock started chiming Ave Maria. This clock had never chimed in its life. It was a moment that legitimately made me believe ghosts could be a possibility. It was both scary and kind of comforting. So, thank you for sharing that with us. That was a, that's, it's, I feel like that's a very beautiful story. Like, I'm sure it's also very scary, but like, that's a wonderful um, way to connect with a loved one. So. That was really nice. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. Yeah, it wasn't so much scary as it was very beautiful and right. there was a connection between right. families. Um, but that was really nice. Um, thank you for your submission. Um, we have another one from Peter Russell. Um, okay, so it says, so he wrote, Ellie and myself have been paranormally investigating scientifically and objectively for seven years. One instance stands out and one we could not explain was seen in the bedroom of an old farm cottage where a light formed in the ceiling over a bed, remained for some 30 minutes, then gradually disappeared. Its light shone down over a picture with the words, I am the Lord, I change not. We have since examined the ceiling, room, etc., and could not find the reason for the phenomenon. Another interesting instance was myself hearing an old dot matrix printer working, and seconds later, Ellie said the same thing. We then found a dot matrix printer dismantled in an equipment rack. 
We are continuing our investigations reporting EVPs in local cemeteries with some success. The printer one got me. <laughs> I've, I feel like I've, I've definitely, like in scary movies, like you hear things that are working that no one's turned on. Like, well, yeah, with the clock, the printer. And I feel like those can be very scary when it happens in the moment. Um, things that are done by themselves, like the bookshelf, uh, the instance with the chair, right? Where things seemingly move on their own, but maybe are controlled by something else that we don't know. Another cool thing about the story is that it referenced the Lord. Oftentimes, like in ghost stories, we hear more about like the devil, Satan, you know, sort of like warding off of that. We never hear about like uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then oftentimes it's sort of not seen, seen as a ghost story. It's seen more as like a miracle, right? Um, but that's definitely a ghost story. Isn't there a story about some people hearing a woman's laughter in the bedrooms? It's kind of added to the idea of the whole process of lesbian space. I've never heard of that, but that sounds really interesting. Say yeah, more. I personally haven't heard about that either. Say more. <laughs> Audrey's one of our educators. Yes. I don't have any more. <laughs> it's like the monk and the children. Like, it's just one of those where it's a it's hmm. we you know where people have reported on having those experiences so the water on the stairs yeah um yeah as i did mention they put uh they believed that ghosts historically can't cross water usually it's running water which you might see in movies and stories um but water in general they kind of adapted it to the space um and so when jane adams and ellen gates star first um moved into hull house they noticed that the people who were also renting the space at the same time would put a bowl of water um, at the bottom of the stairs in hopes that the ghosts could not come down from the attic stairs to the second floor. Um, so, yeah. It's definitely a space. And I want to go back to someone like, is there bad energy and what Nadia was saying? Nothing violent ever happened at Hall House. Right. So there's there was no murder. There was no anything like that. So the energy that you feel is really more just intensity, the mm -hmm. fact that so much work happened there and that people lived there for so long. Um, because yeah, nothing terrible ever happened there. And as Nadi was saying, like we get uh, stories of like children running around since there were so many children walking in and out. And of course people had passed away here because it was at a time where healthcare wasn't really accessible, right? Medical care, medical science hadn't really advanced as much. So people, people were sick and people died. And that was just something that had happened. Um, and that would be including children as well. So sometimes people would hear children laughing and I'm like, that sounds, that sounds about right, right? At that time, a lot of children were passing away, uh, which if you go on one of our tours, you can learn more about like the mortality rate. You can hear more about like the neighborhood and its conditions. And it's really interesting to hear. Um, is there a specific color of blue painted on our covered wall? <gasps> I didn't know that was paint blue. I knew about that, but that's exciting. So it says in the chat, um, our uh, Michael, one of our uh, staff members wrote, there is a specific color of blue paint painted on our covered walkway that I believe stems from New Orleans culture of warding off evil spirits. And the color is called paint blue. That's very common in the South that people will paint their porches, this particular shade of blue because they believe that. Um, and so that's fantastic. I did not know that. It's mm, really interesting. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Did you experience any changes in appetite when locked in the kitchen? Um, I was just putting my lunch away. It was early in the morning. I wasn't really eating. Uh, it's always like when I when I walk in at the first time or when I'm about to leave. So I'm not really there to eat. I'm usually there to pick something up or drop something off. Um, but I definitely feel fear. So I feel like I wouldn't eat while I'm afraid. <laughs> Um, when I met my future husband, I was always amazed that he had often found coins on the sidewalk. I had never found even a penny until my father passed away. I started finding pennies, which were, I referred to as pennies from heaven. 32 years later, my mother passed. A few days later after her passing, I found another penny on the sidewalk. When I picked it up from there, was a, there, was an, there was another penny underneath. Thanks, mom. So you're just trying to make sure you can buy yourself some chips. That's a beautiful one. Thank you for sharing. That is really beautiful. Yes, around the doors, windows, especially to keep entities from entering. Well, I've never heard of the blue paint. That's yeah. really interesting. I want to do more research on that. Um, to share one that I've experienced just 
outside of Hull House. Um, the most memorable one for me was one day I was sitting um, with my sister and we were watching television and in the corner of the room, we had one of those, we have still, it's still there, one of these bookcases that like ends in a triangle in the back so it fits directly into the corner real snugly. And um, it's on the second floor. It's in a very stable part of the house. Um, we were just watching television and all of a sudden that bookcase started to like gently rock back and forth. And it started very light and it just kept getting to be a bigger swing. And it was one of those situations where we froze. We didn't know how to respond. And I want to say that that kept going for at least 30 seconds. And then it just stopped and hasn't ever done anything since. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Do you believe the house itself is a conduit for spirits? Um, I myself believe that like all house carries an energy um, from people who live there. People put, you know, live their lives there. People put uh, energy into like things that are important to them, their bed, their kitchen table, right? Paintings um, and even a house itself. But I, I don't think pe like spirits linger, like all like physical, like how we see them, like, oh, the, you know, the entire uh, being and personality and, uh, of Mrs. Hall is there. Uh, but there is definitely remnants of her left. That's something I believe. Hmm. Most stores have to call the building the portal to hell. That's true, particularly the courtyard. And that's also true. Nadia, do you believe that the house of the conduits for spirits? I believe the same as you um, in that spaces keep the energy that people put into it. And for a space that was frequented by so many people and so much was being done there and so much of what was going on in people's lives was really difficult or very... Um, uh, really affecting them and so I think that they brought that with them and that can linger in a space personally so um, the Museum of Science and Industry building is very old and weird and most of the experiences I've had and other staff has had were like yours hearing our names footsteps I would get tapped on the back a lot when no one was there even if I had a backpack on thank you for sharing that Allison um, I also used to work at the Museum of Science and Industry and I worked in the um, U505 submarine and there were some creepy times never saw anything never had anything happen directly to me but i just would get a feeling in some spaces and one time i was in um a particular part of the boat and i just did not want to be there anymore it was just like really intense it did not feel good so yeah yes the devil in the white city is a fantastic book um definitely check that out uh that ties to the museum of science and industry directly in a lot of ways but uh, it's fantastic. It's a really good read, um, especially if you like spooky things. And mm -hmm. yeah, Chicago. Yep. Any other questions folks have before we end? We have like about 10 minutes left. If anyone has any last burning questions, feel free to ask now. Favorite Chicago ghost stories? Mm -hmm. The big one that I'm thinking of is Resurrection Mary. Um, she's known across the country. Um, and so that story is uh, that a young woman was attending a dance um, and she, there are different ver versions of it, but typically she gets into an argument with her beloved at the dance. And so instead of riding home with him in his car, she decides to just walk home. And so as she's making her way back home, she's very tragically struck by a car and she dies. Um, and so it's said that her her ghost stays along and it's Archer Avenue. So um, it's runs, it's a pretty long road in the Chicagoland area. Um, and so it's said that she walks, is seen walking, especially at night in her white party dress um, along the, the sidewalk and then will often be picked up by uh, just people driving by asking to go home. And then they take her to the cemetery that is nearby um, and then she disappears. So yeah, I, there are some fantastic podcasts. I'd say definitely uh, search up in your podcast app, just look up Resurrection Mary and there's some really great series on her if you're interested, so. Mob Ghosts, yeah. Al Capone. Capone's a big one. Yeah. Like the, there's a, there's a tour around the city called the Ghost and Gangster Store because they intersect so, they intersect so much. So mm -hmm. like, they really have like both the gangsters and ghosts. So, yeah. so they get both and both because they really intersect so much. Lore has a really good- um, Michael says that his mother has picked up Mary. 
Wow. That's amazing. Um, yeah, Lore, Audrey mentioned, sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you, Stefan. Uh, Audrey wrote in the chat that the podcast Lore has a great episode on Chicago and the Hull House neighborhood. Um, so definitely check that out. That's a fantastic show in general. So. Shout out to Hull House. We learned about it. And Adam's sociology class inspired me to join this call. Well, we're glad that you heard about it. A lock horror story? What, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure either. Hmm. I've never heard of that. Anyone have any other questions or do you want to say a little bit more about what that means? Hmm. I'm waiting for the chat. Thank you for putting this together and this tour together. It's been fun and fascinating. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to work on. This has Truly been a lot of fun. Pleasure. We've been wanting to do a ghost anything for a long time since so many people are so interested and in, we ourselves are interested in like the stories, the origins, uh, the social repercussions of those stories, right? Uh, it's really, really cool to have uh, created this and to see so many of you interested in learning about them as well. Yes. Yes, we would, and we're eagerly waiting for when we're able to be on site again. But in the meantime, remember to check out that virtual tour um, because it's there's a lot to see. Wrapping up, okay, we're flying forward into all this coming together. This is fun. Thanks for putting this together. Shout out to spooky music too. Thank you. Sometimes you'll hear it and then sometimes it'll go away. Yeah. But I'm glad of the end, like the energy and the atmosphere it puts into the call when you do hear it. So thank mm -hmm. you. How will we know? Follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, on our website. We post a lot. Um, Wholehousemuseum.org. Um, yes on Instagram, all of that. Uh, someone can put like our handles so people can follow us if they are not already following us that I would really appreciate that. Um, yes, Audrey and Eddie have been putting links to the actual website. Uh, Tampa, oh my God, I'm so glad so many people from all over oh, are yeah. able to uh, join Something in. Some the UK as well, which was exciting. Ooh. New York City, wow, that's so amazing. Yeah. Jay a h h m instagram georgia new mexico well thank you guys for taking time to hang out with us because this was really really fun um and we're really glad that we got to do it from india amazing yeah. thank you for joining us that's so, so. cool chicago <laughs> yes we're also from chicago uh <laughs> some of us some of us are in chicago um Another India that's so exciting, Colorado. I'm about to burst into tears. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, this was really fun. Thank you all so much. I think we're UK, Chicago, Ellie and Pete. Oh, are you the, the folks who submitted the stories? Because I know Ellie and Pete was... Uh, I believe so. Yes. Thank you for sharing it with us. It was really cool. Yeah, that was a really good story. I got some shivers. Um, yeah, I think we can start wrapping up. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining. Please look at our social media, Instagram. Our handles are in um, are in the chat, our website uh, for more future events. We're going to have more family days. Um, Ross, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, Stefan and Nadia for putting together this great program. Um, we will be doing these in the future because um, there's lots of interest in this and we can't wait to have you all back at Whole House in person. Um, but uh, I can, is in the chat, drop us a line and stop at the Whole House Museum virtually on our website. Um, if you like this event and you're wondering, well, how can I hang out with Stefan and Audrey and Nadia and Eddie and our educating team at Whole House more, um, we'll be back here on uh, November 1st, just before election day, talking about art and democracy at Whole House um, and the combination of uh, how people got to express themselves um, at Whole House in other ways outside of voting. Um, so come back and join us for that. And I like, as I mentioned before, on October 22nd um, at 6 p.m. Chicago time, we're also hosting an event about feminism 
and art, uh, feminism and uh, art institutions and art organizations um, from 1800 or from 1890s through to the present. Um, so join us for Thursday evening to talk about art and democracy uh, in, uh, this coming week as well. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Um, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to find out what other programs we're going to be hosting um, as well. So thanks a lot for joining us. <laughs>